You glad you came to church today? Me too. Me too. All right, I got about 20 minutes, and uh, I got about 35 minutes of material. How many guys don't mind staying a little long today? All right. You're all going to heaven. How many guys would mind staying a little longer? I'll make sure. Um, I want us to get ready for this week. I want us to get ready for Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. I want us to get ready for the rest of our lives. What Jesus did about 1,985 years ago is well known. I, I, I'm not saying the whole earth knows his name. I'm not saying the whole world knows what the cross means or so forth. But certainly one of the best known stories of all time in, in mankind is the story of the cross, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And I find that knowing the story has a, a certain informative effect. The what always has an effect. But really the power of the gospel is not in just what Jesus did, but why he did it. The thing that makes the gospel of Jesus Christ good news is not just that there's a way out of hell into heaven. The, the thing that makes the gospel such good news is why Jesus made a way with his life, his death, and his resurrection. And I want us to talk about this today because I think it's largely unknown. Can I, can I be so bold as to say, I think even amongst people in the Western world that would say, are you a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, an atheist, they'd say, I'm a Christian. I think that what we're going to talk about today is still largely unknown even amongst those who would call themselves followers of Christ. And, and if this body today, the body of Christ, and this is us, this is the internet, this is the radio, this is those who are going to be here Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, um, I think if we need to know anything, it's not just what Jesus did again, but why he did it for the first time and to get this. Let me tell you my story. Before I knew the Lord, I remember very clearly um, the fear that was just ever present. I remember um, that every time the phone rang, I would wonder, is today that day of reckoning? It was like every mistake, every imperfection that I was so prone to doing, you know, I, I could tell a lie and get away with it. I could blame it on somebody else and not feel guilty about it. I could, you know, shift my responsibility to someone else and not carry the weight of it. But it was almost like every imperfection was like another snowflake on, like, like I'm in a mountain pass and there's a steep mountain above me and every imperfection is a snowflake that's mounting up to more and more weight and I'm waiting for this day where the avalanche releases and I get buried in my own stupidity. I mean, what I'm talking about. Like, one of these days, she's going to find out about her. One of these days, the teacher in the attendance office is going to find out it's not my dad calling me in sick, it's me calling me in sick. One day, thanks, Mary, for laughing. You were there, too. One of these days, the guy I'm selling dope to is going to find out that part of it's oregano. One of these days, you know, one of these days, every lie, these snowflakes are falling on this mountain pass, and sooner or later, someone's going to catch on to something and going to say, no, it's not him, and it's not that, and this is the truth, and boom, she's pregnant. Boom, she found out about the other girl. Boom, I'm, I'm getting killed in an alleyway in a drug deal. Boom, I, I get myself killed in a car accident, or worse, I hurt other people because I was drunk. I, I, you live on this edge of maybe there won't be consequences this time when you live outside of the grace of God. And I remember feeling that, that daily weight. So it's like, what am I going to do with this weight of imperfection? And, and that's where we kind of came to religion. <laughs> you know, what is religion? Religion is a system of moral behavior strictly adhered to for the purpose of becoming good enough to be accepted by God, others, or yourself. Does that sound like that's an answer? You know, like, if I can just find out who not to murder, everything will be okay. If I can just figure out how to not lie, everything will be okay. The problem is, once you tell a lie, anybody know what you got to do next? You guys saw another one to guard the first one. I like one of the things Mark Twain said the most. He said, I, I always tell the truth. That way I never have to remember what I said. It's just a nice way to live. But what do you do when you know the right things? When religion says, this you thou shalt do and thou shalt not do, but you're still not doing it. Well, religion's answer most of the time, is best answer to failure, is more religion. So you should try harder. You can go to mass more often. You should go to a meeting daily. You should go to, uh, you should pray, you should fast. You should read more. You should write more. You're only praying 15 minutes. Try praying half an hour, and then you'll stop being you at some point. And what I find is, and I'm not saying prayer is wrong. I'm not saying going to meetings every day in AA. I'm not saying coming to church. I'm not saying going to mass. I'm simply saying this, that religion, most of the time, its power is in asking you for more than you're already giving, thereby putting off the eventual failure that most religion offers. Are you with me on this? You're getting this? So religion, are we, are we getting this? And, and what's funny is if morality is the object of religion, then, then hear me. If, if my morality is proof and evidence of my relationship, then I have to be more moral than people who claim no relationship. So it behooves me to always be surrounded by people that I can look down on. 
because looking down on them elevates me. Are you still here? So can you see where not just religion, but, but any religion, and let's talk about Christianity, for example. Christians, the Christians that I knew, they were more concerned about the length of people's shorts and whether they wore makeup or not. What kind of music do you listen to? Do you smoke, chew, or run with girls that do? And then what I found out was their morality actually worked against me trying to find God. Are you still here? Come on, I'm talking to us this morning. I'm, I'm trying to get all of us to understand one thing that's at the end of this, but we've got to grasp the points between here and there. There, if I am a drunk and I walk into a church, I don't feel like I do when I'm in the bar. I feel like I do when I'm in the church. The morality of Christianity actually counteracted the effect of the grace of God in my life. It, it delayed an eventual submission of my heart to someone who loved me because what I saw in Christians was behavior. And I remember saying things like, well, when, if my life ever gets good enough, then I can go to church. Well, is there anything else in society that's like that? Like, if you're hungry and I say, well, let's go to a restaurant, well, I would, but I'm hungry. I don't want to go there, you know, as people will see my weakness, you know? Hey, you, you, you want to retire someday? Let me introduce you to my financial advisor. I, I you know, I, thanks anyway. Once I'm rich, I'll talk to him. The only closest thing I have to a, a church setting in Western Christianity is a gym. This is a judgment-free zone, so fat people are welcome here at Anytime Fitness. Oh, does somebody grunt? And lunker alert. No, no, we're not allowed to express ourselves to get that extra 10 pounds out of it. We have to be gentlemen and ladies here at the gym. Well, what is that? It's trying to create an environment where people who aren't in shape can come in and get in shape. It's the only culturally relevant example I could think of that is like the church, that as soon as I'm in shape, I'll go to the gym. But can you get in shape outside the gym? As soon as I get my life together, I'll go to church because what they value is what I'm not. And what I'm not is what they value. And until I'm good enough, I've literally invited people to church. They're like, oh, reverend, preacher, father, whatever they want to call me. You know, brother, just sister offends me, but everything else is fine. You know, you know I, if I walked in that building, the walls would fall down. I'm like, listen, if I can walk in the building, the walls don't fall down. You, you got nothing on the preacher. Because I know the difference between right and wrong, and I still choose wrong sometimes. Yeah, you amend it half-heartedly, but I know what you're talking about. Listen, the, the pharisaical mindset, the, the religious mindset, always needs someone worse around them so they can feel better about themselves. But the Jesus mindset says, come to me. You're weary, you're heavy laden, you're stupid, you, you, got, you got issues, you got problems, you can't stop sinning, you're, you're demon possessed. Yeah, this direction, not that direction. We're, we, we teach people, we train people to run from the solution when the solution is inviting people to himself. Because, and, and, and so this is where we have to be very careful, guys, as a church, to understand really not just what Jesus did, and then what the fruit of that must be morality. What did Jesus do? And if we understand what he did, but we understand why he did it, it may change the way we view ourselves and others. This is what you got to know, guys. Um, yeah, the Christians I knew seem to teach manners from what I needed with surgery. Sorry, too late for that one, but it was good. Uh, Jesus is the only, everybody say only. The only answer to mankind's questions about guilt and innocence before God, man, and self. Let me show you what I mean. Open your Bibles to John chapter 8, and I want to, I want to walk you through a, a story that illustrates this extraordinarily well. It's Jesus and some Pharisees in the temple courts, a woman who's been caught in the act of adultery, and the trial, the public trial of her sin and the penalty phase all takes place in, in one location. And we're going to see something, I think, from not just what Jesus is about to do for her, but why he did it. Um, at dawn, John chapter 8, verse 2, at dawn, he, being Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now, let me ask you a question. Why are people gathering to hear Jesus talk? What is it about his words that are causing crowds to stop what they're doing? They can listen to that teacher, this teacher, go sacrifice, get a, get a priest to talk to him, get a, a rabbi to... Why is this, why is this Galilee... Oh, that's a good noise. Why, why, are the, why is a Galilean rabbi from Bethlehem, from Nazareth? Why, why is this one guy commanding so much attention? He goes, oh, it's early in the morning, dawns, and there's animals, and they're all on their way to be butchered and, and sacrificed, and all of a sudden Jesus sits down, and it's just like E.F. Hutton. Everybody stops because Jesus is about to speak. Why is it... His words are different from every other man's words in the temple courts and every other synagogue. And the answer is this. He was teaching them how to be free instead of teaching them why they needed to be good prisoners. If you look at the teaching of Jesus, he's never preparing us to be good slaves. He's always preparing us to be sons and heirs. 
the, the, the revelation of relationship elevates those in that relationship. And from that elevated position, yes, there are things that change. Yes, there's things we stop doing because we love Jesus. There's things we start doing because we love Jesus. His love both constrains us and compels us to be different people. But it's his love, not the religious indoctrination of, of, of movements of God that have been over with for 100 years. And, and I, I'm going to say this to the kids tonight. It's totally off my notes, but can, I, can you give me 90 more seconds to explain something to you? Every generation needs a revelation of Jesus Christ. I just want to say to our kids tonight, you need your own personal revelation of Jesus Christ. Because my faith, my doctrine, my trust, my tradition cannot help you when you join the Marine Corps. It cannot be there for you when, when you're, when you're in, in the fraternity at college. Your parents' faith, their revelation of God created certain dynamics in your home, and you've lived those dynamics, but outside of a relationship, those dynamics are more bondage than they are freedom. They protect you. They, they shield you. They guarded you. But now that you're on your own, their faith will not help you. You've got to have your own personal revelation of who Jesus is. And until you have that revelation, all you have is the rules that are leftovers from other people's revelations throughout history. The holiness movement... People had such an encounter with God that they stopped doing things and they started doing other things. And factories shut down for three weeks so that revivals could take place on the factory floor. Sweatshops, sewing shops, things that were formerly owned by evil people that were slaves. They, they were like, you know, let's, let's just, well, I, I need my whole factory. Everybody needs to know this. And the sweatshops were closed down for weeks. Prophets went in the toilet because people stood up and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit fell and entire cities were won to Christ. Bars closed down. Brothels closed down. Prostitutes started of becoming preachers. You know what I'm talking about? Like revival. Not good music. Not, hey, I felt a warm fuzzy. I mean, get down repentance in the dirt loving Jesus people. Here's the problem. Those people had children. I don't know how. They were holy. But they had children. And when they had children, the revelation of their relationship was, it was imported into the home that those children were raised in. And that protected them and guarded them and shielded them. But then those people had children. You grow up, you know where I'm going with this? The revelation of generation number one is now the religion of generation number three. And eventually, we get tired of being told what to do with no relationship to guide us into that behavior. Are you here? Every generation needs a revelation of Jesus Christ. At dawn, Jesus is teaching them about a God who's alive and real and is not a biblical code and is not a yoke of a rabbi, but is literally an engaging, come know the Father through the Son. And people are saying, stop everything, because there's a part of me that knows I need what he's saying. There's life in his words. Look at this. Um, the teachers of the law... And the Pharisees, here comes the religious sect. Again, the Pharisees were awesome during the Maccabean Revolt, but now this is three generations later. What's happened is the passion of their grandfather has become the religion of the grandson. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees uh, brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. This is my nightmare. This is my avalanche from when I was a kid. This is my moment when the phone rings and it's the principal, it's the police officer, it's the girl's father, it's the girl. This is, this is the day of reckoning. What she was doing in secret, looking for something she couldn't find through legal means, she began to experiment with illegal means, first in her mind, then in her heart, and then with her body. It's, it's fascinating that she was caught in the act of adultery, but there's no man there. It's always bothered me a little bit. He was faster, I, I don't know, somehow... He wasn't caught in the act of adultery, only she was. It seems odd, you know. But what they're saying is we found someone who's not meeting our moral code that our grandfather got from a revelation and a relationship with God. We found somebody worse than us. And we are justified in judging her even if it costs her her life. Doesn't happen anymore though, right? Yeah, we, we would never treat people this way today in Christianity, would we? Hey, listen. Pharisee test, okay? Nothing excites a Pharisee like a good stoning. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channels where there's always a good stoning going on, if you follow the people on Facebook that just do nothing but stone their brethren, let me tell you something. The love of God covers. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. It's time for us to stop looking for sin and start looking for God. And, and the judgmentism, the judgment, judgmentality, judgmentalism, there it is, of the church is actually keeping a lot of people from a merciful God because they think we're all about morality instead of something else we're going to talk about later on. 
Listen, nothing excites a Pharisee like a good stoning. My good friend Mike taught me that. Uh, Mike Miller, it's, he just said that. And I laughed. I thought, that is so true, <laughs> you know? And this was my nightmare. Everyone, everyone knew what she did. Everyone. She's ashamed, and everybody feels, I'm just glad I'm not that poor bugger. She, you know? You know the difference between most of the people in this room and most of the people that are sitting in prison today? You want to know what it is? <laughs> they got caught. Just a thought. Okay. And this is what they say. In the law of Moses, the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question. They didn't really care about him or her. They're just about it was a trap in order to, to have a basis for accusing him. In other words, if Jesus says, yep, the law of Moses says this, but we shouldn't do that. Well, now he's a heretic and they can discount him. He's in that 50% they're better than. They can actually form charges of blasphemy and try to go to the Romans to get him executed, which they eventually try to do and succeed in in some ways uh, as a blasphemer, one who doesn't obey the law. But if he says no, stoner, well, now he's in breach of the Roman rule because he has no right to you know, condemn somebody for a capital crime. If he says she's, she should go free, the Jews get to judge him. If he says she shouldn't go free, the Romans get to judge him. It's the Kobayashi Maru test, right? It's the no-one scenario. He is surrounded by Klingons, and the answer is binary. On or off, how do you want to die, this way or this way? And instead of that binary choice, he uses the same law because Jesus is the word of God, and he bends down, and he begins to write in his, with his finger in the dirt in the temple courts. Now, people have said, I wonder what he wrote. We'll, we'll never know this side of eternity, but there's some fascinating theories. You guys want some theology? Okay, so some people think he write, okay, you know, um, I'm trying to think of somebody's name, uh, Harvey, you know, uh, lied to his tax attorney. You know, some people think that's what he's writing. Or, or he's writing the name like this guy is, you know, Benjamin, the, the, the Pharisee, and he writes somebody next to it, Ruth, which is his mistress. How many of you guys know that might change your argument a little bit if he's doing that? But I think what's actually happening here goes back to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jesus quotes Jeremiah more often than any of the other prophets. And I think what's going on here, Jeremiah 17 it talks about God stooping down on this holy mountain, which is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, in his holy city, on his holy mountain, stooping down and taking a, a pen of iron with a tip uh, like a diamond and engraving in there the sins of his people. And I think what's happening is he's saying he's actually fulfilling prophecy. He, he's saying there's, there's going to come a day of judgment, and they are not far off from that judgment, and this is what they'll be judged for. They have no mercy the, the, the code that was meant to bring them to some sense of failure, crying out for a savior. Instead, they, they become hypocrites, pretending they're obeying it and judging those whom they, they deem less than them. And God just says, I'm done with this. And Jesus bends over and fulfilling Jeremiah chapter 17 begins to write on this, condemning them. You guys are, this is what you're doing. So it says this, when they kept on questioning him, come on, answer us. Is it, is it Moses or is it Rome? What's it gonna be? He straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who's without sin be the first to cast this stone. Deuteronomy 22, verse 2 it says if you commit adultery you should be stoned to death but it also says in Deuteronomy chapter 19 verses 18 and 19 that people who lie should be killed too and so it says it, it takes two of our witnesses and so he refers to that who's going to be the first witness who'll be the first one to stand up and risk your life by saying you witnessed or commit adultery who who was there it's funny the guy's not there they didn't catch him and it's funny you found somebody in the act of adultery but you can't seem to like who who here saw her do this who is her accuser? You be the first of two witnesses to establish this before a court, and nobody comes forward. And not only do they come forward, but, but look at this. It says, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground at, at, at this. And those who heard began, um, began 90, demand, began to, began to walk away one at a time until the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with a woman still standing there. Understand this. Here's a question. Jesus says, you without sin cast the first stone. And this crowd, you know, give us Barabbas, stoner. All of a sudden, they're quiet. Jesus goes back to writing some stuff on the ground. And one by one, they leave. And they leave. Did you notice what order they leave in? From the oldest to the, why? Like, why do you think the older ones leave first? And, and I think this is my answer. I think you reach a certain age, and the idealism, the dogma, the uh, fundamentalism of your youth. I'm going to conquer, and we're going to win the, and we're changing the, and it's going to... And by the time you get about, oh, 50, you kind of go, huh. I remember talking to God one time. I'd failed in the same place I'd failed my whole life. I'd become very angry about something. I just filled out a prayer request this morning saying, just prayer team, would you just intercede for me? I, I get frustrated. When I get frustrated, I get angry trying to regain control. And, you know, Pastor Jim, I mean, Jim's a jerk, but Pastor Jim shouldn't be a jerk. 
You didn't hear my wife say amen. She did it silently in, in sign language, you know. And, and I, I'd failed in this place. I'm walking around on a retreat, and I'm just saying, God, am I going to die like this? Am I going to die having never conquered my own anger? Is this how I am? Do I die an angry person having hurt people and offended people and people that are volunteering? And I'm like, yeah, you did it wrong, and I don't want to see that. I want to hear it. I want to... Like, is that, like, that going to be the legacy of Jim Weekend? He was a good man, kind of a jerk, but he got a lot done. Uh, it's just the way Jim is. I don't want to be just the way Jim is. I want to be just the way Jesus is. So I'm like, am I going to die this way? And I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, well, what, what have I said to you? How have I, in the word, I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that's the problem. I'm supposed to love you with all my heart when it's an angry heart. I'm supposed to love you with all my soul. when it, Obviously, it's broken somewhere if I'm still being a jerk. I'm supposed to love you with all my spirit when it seems like I give myself over to this, this anger. Like, almost like it's a different person I become. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm possessed or oppressed. I just, I just think I'm fleshy. You know what I mean? Am I going to die this way? And God said... Jim, I command you to love me with everything. Are you doing that? No, thanks. I feel condemned. Good talk. It's like, what, what else are you trying to say? And I, you know, I ask you to love me with all of your heart. And I know your heart sucks in places. I know you're the kind of person that says the word sucks in church. <laughs> and you don't even have enough conscience to feel bad about that. I, I know you. Man, I know you. I knew the 16-year-old kid I saved at a rock concert. I knew he couldn't get saved in church because he was afraid of those people because he was the fat guy walking into the gym morally. I've known you your whole life, buddy. Nothing you've ever done has ever surprised me, and I died for everything you've done, doing, and are going to do. I defeated it with my body, my life, my love. Like, the day you stop trying to be perfect and just accept the fact that your imperfections are met with my perfections... And your rest of my love is the day you'll stop being angry because you won't think you are God anymore anyway. That's funny. Men said amen and women laughed. Isn't that funny? There was a unique gender thing there. So Jesus straightens up and he asks the woman, woman, where are your accusers? Where are they gone? Has no one condemned you? No one came to witness? I, I guess the court's over with. I guess it's been dismissed. Your case has been dismissed. And she said, no one, sir. He said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, now go and leave your life of sin. Let me ask you one last question. You guys doing okay? That was not the last question, by the way. That was a question before the question. (laughs) Did she leave her life of sin? I mean, she just got a second chance, right? Did she leave her life of sin? You know, I've been studying this. What I'm about to teach is not theology, but it's decent theology. I'd say I'm 95% sure that based on other biblical uh, records of people, stories that haven't matched up, that almost look like they're a different story from gospel to gospel. They don't, like, that must be a different one, but how can it be? Because she's pouring alabaster jars of perfume, and yet there's another one, and who's this Simon the leper? And, and he's got a sister named Mary, and another one named Martha. Well, is that Lazarus? And by the time you put all these pieces together, here's my 95, you want to hear my 95% theory? This woman who is just forgiven, I think, is Mary Magdalene. I think she had seven demons inside of her, and Jesus set her free. I and mean, when he said, go and sin no more, I, I, think, I think she did. Go and sin no more. I think, as a matter of fact, she is the woman who had had an evil past. She'd been a prostitute. She'd been a, a wicked woman, according to Scripture. I think that her brother is, is Lazarus, also known as Simon the leper. This is why Lazarus dies. He's resurrected. And this is why a, a, an unclean woman, a prostitute, is welcomed in, in a Pharisee's home. There's no other explanation I can find. This is why he knew her past, and yet she was welcome. And she touches Jesus. She's weeping because she has something with Jesus that Simon the leper, also known as Lazarus, the resurrected Pharisee, doesn't have. And, and if that's true, then she is the one who breaks the alabaster jar. And Jesus says, every time, no matter how long this world lives, the gospel is preached, we're going to remember this woman. This is the same woman, then, who chooses to be at the feet of Jesus while Martha, her sister, is doing arrangements and says, hey, come on, tell my sister to help me. He goes, listen, there's a lot of choices we've got to make in this life, but I'm sitting here right now, and Mary's making the right choice. Do the dishes later. If that's true, then this is also the woman who is left with another woman named Mary, the mother of Jesus at Jesus' crucifixion, who wasn't afraid for her own life, but stayed there comforting Jesus' mom, watching her beloved be crucified on the cross. And if that's true, then she's the one that went on Easter Sunday morning with expensive perfume to go and anoint Jesus' body for burial. And if that's true, then she's also the one that got to see Jesus risen from the dead the very first time. And I don't know if that's her or not. I'm 95% sure. It's the King Jim version. It's theriology. But let's go back to the question. 
did she leave her life of sin? I'll just, I'll just close it out this way, and this is what I've been trying to say the whole time. I think the answer to that question comes in the form of maybe another question. When she committed adultery, when she fell in love with a married, a married man, or when she stepped out on her husband to have intercourse with uh, another man, let me ask you this, what was she looking for? Did she leave her life of sin? Let's, that's a good question. Let's ask another question. If she was going to follow Jesus, what was she looking for in human contact, human tenderness, human sexuality, human affection? Because if she found it in her sin and in her shame for a moment, the counterfeit, then certainly this man who stood up for her, this man who defended her, this man who rescued her, this man who loved her, this man who staked his reputation on her, this man who didn't leave her, this man who didn't condemn her, this man who stood by her. If she was looking for that in the tent of that other man, she didn't find it, but at the feet of Jesus, she did. Did she go and leave her life of sin? I think she did. And I'll tell you this. I remember it was like to live without Jesus. I know what it is to like when, to live with him. I did not quit drinking. My parents are watching this. I hate talking about that season of my life. Sorry, Mom. Sorry, Dad. I didn't quit drinking because suddenly I realized it was wrong. I didn't quit drinking because suddenly I had this willpower that magically appeared and all of a sudden it just tasted like carbonated goat urine in my mouth. Please hear me. Everything I've said today comes down to this last sentence. I quit drinking because I found in Jesus what I was looking for. At the bottom of every bottle of tequila I ever emptied, I found what she found. I found someone who didn't leave me, who didn't abandon me, who loved me in spite of my stupid, who took a broken heart and welcomed it. I didn't find it in a church. I didn't find it in religion. I didn't find it in piety. I didn't find it through just say this prayer or repeat after me or come to these meetings. I found sobriety because I was drunk, because I was looking for Jesus. And when I found him, I didn't need to be drunk anymore. Does it make sense? You know the answer for every addiction? This is going to sound so trite, but I'm telling you, it is so true. And if you hear it, it's so powerful. The answer, the answer for every addiction, for every failure, for every sin, for every knocking on the wrong door to have a momentary satisfying experience and lifelong shame and guilt as another snowflake is put on the avalanche of judgment coming at your head at some undetermined amount of time that's terrifying. You know what it is? If you just found Jesus, you would find that he's better than what was at the bottom of the bottle. If you just found Jesus, you would find that, that he's actually for you and not against you. He's not waiting for you to clean yourself up before you're okay with him. He has loved and forgiven a 52-year-old preacher for the last 35 years since I first said, will you help me? He's been saying yes. Will I die an angry man? I don't even think it's the question anymore. Will I die with Jesus still loving me? Yeah. And does that give me peace? Yeah. And does that help me with my anger? Oh, yeah. Because if God gives me grace, then I can actually find a little bit more for, like, you. <laughs> if I appreciate his mercy, it gives me more for you. And if I appreciate his love, it gives me more for you. If I appreciate his generosity, it gives me more for you. Does this make sense? So I'm not the product of generations of Christian behavior being heaped onto a young man's soul. I'm the son of an atheist. Who walked into a rock concert where most Christians said it was wrong to make drums and lights and, and bass guitars and people in spandex pants and perms. These were men, by the way, perms. That's evil on the cover of magazines, the evil of contemporary Christian music. No one can be saved at these things because Jesus wouldn't show up to them. Just stupid, leftover remnants of a movement that had moved on 50 years prior, but was still scary enough to draw crowds. Does this make sense? I didn't meet the Jesus of the holiness movement. I needed a revelation of who Jesus was for a 16-year-old kid. And he met me there. Can I tell you something else that's really exciting? He's still meeting me as a 52-year-old grandfather. He's still right here. He's with me. He's not against me. He cheers me on. He doesn't discourage me. He corrects me when I'm wrong. But he does it in such a way that it makes me want to be right, not just feel bad for being wrong. This is what Easter is. Easter is for God so loved the world. 
Easter is Jesus saying, I died for you, and I'd do it again if it'd do any good. I'd do it a thousand times if it did any good, but I've, I've done all that needs to be done. Now it's about this. Before we stand to our feet and we close today, here's my statement to you, the parents, the grandparents, or the kids I'll be speaking to tonight. You need your own revelation of Jesus Christ more than you need my religious indoctrination, more than you need the doctrines and the tenets of faith. I was born breach into the kingdom. I came out completely butt first. I met Jesus not knowing the Bible and then read the Bible and said, hey, this is the guy I met at the rock concert. True story. I didn't ascend to faith through knowledge and then accept knowledge with my heart. I accepted Jesus with my heart and then learned about who he was through reading scripture and going, this lines up with this and this lines up with that. This was obviously a book about this guy. And I'm here to tell you today that God's not done giving personal revelations to people that ask for them. This is why we're commanded not just to seek his hands, but to seek his face. My people, call by name, humble themselves, pray, turn away from it, seek my face. There's something about seeing him as he is that changes who you are. And morality will be a fruit of this, I assume. Perfection. I don't even worry about it. What I love is that I got to bring my imperfections to his perfections and his perfection. It's, it's, it's the rock over the scissors, man. It, it's, it's the paper over the rock. It's, it's, the, it's the right bower. I don't call it a trump card anymore because now it's political, but you know what I'm talking about. It's the right bower. It's the Trump over Hillary. Are you hear what I'm saying? It's just a, it's a joke. Joke, joke, joke. It's a joke, it's a joke. I was so close to getting saved and you said that, you know. Stand your feet, please, all over this room. Listen to me. I'm gonna let you go. But this is what you need. So this is where we've journeyed. I'm sorry I cried today. I talked to Pat Brady on the phone and there's still some residue of that in my life. I know why Jesus did what he did about 1985 years ago. I know what he did for a long time, but I know why he did it. And I'm growing more and more in that knowledge why he did it, why he did it, why I'm doing it, why I live for my wife, why I live for our sons, why I live for my daughter-in-law, why I live for our grandson. Love will make you do crazy stuff. Would you close your eyes right now in this room? Would you just, don't, don't look at your perfections and imperfections and judge whether or not you're worthy to come into his presence. He's sitting on a throne, he's a king, but you're approaching the, the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment. You're, you're approaching the God of mercy not, not this prude with Ten Commandments in one hand and a, a rolling pin in the other wanting to play whack-a-mole with your life. Whatever 16 is subtracted from 52 years ago, for that many years, I keep wrestling with me. But the older I get, the more I realize in my imperfections, I'm going to die with some. And that's why I need his perfection in my life. And that's why he offered me his perfect son, Jesus, to be the perfect sacrifice because of love. For God so loved me that Jesus came and died. God so loved me, he inspired some guy that could play a guitar and keyboard and drums to start a band, knowing the church would hate him for doing it. Pharisees threw their rocks, but they dodged him somehow and got through to a kid that had never gone to a church service, but had never gone to a mass, but had never gone to uh, an orator on a stage. ADD and someone talking for an hour and a half is, they just, they don't, that's what, that's what you do to torture kids like me. That's not what you do to bless them. But God loved the world so much. God loved Jim Wiegand. God loves you so much. That he will move heaven and earth to make sure you understand, to make sure you see, to make sure you hear, to make sure you feel. So Father, right now I pray, if there's anything this room needs right now, we need solutions, we need answers, we need miracles. But what would they be without knowing you? If you heal us, we're still going to die someday. If we die and you raise us from the dead, Lazarus died again. Until there's the seeds of eternity planted in our heart and the good soil of our, our soul watered by a consistent rain of your love, God, how will we ever find our way through this mess of a world? I pray against the whole judgmental Pharisee garbage that literally has condemned untold millions to an eternity, having never even asked the right questions. And I come against it in me. I come against it in us. You had a habit of finding the worst guy in the room and making him your best friend. 
<laughs> an equal habit of finding the guy who thought he was the best guy in the room and making him your worst enemy. You comforted the afflicted. You managed you afflict the comfortable. Do it again in my generation, God. We need a revelation, our own personal revelation of who you are, and I pray for that today. So this is what we're going to do. Right there, eyes closed, heads bowed, you and God. Sometimes God just shows up and blows up. Sometimes it's a progressive conversation and walk. Sometimes it's sometimes it's the strangest of things. Sometimes I heard a friend of mine, Brian, the other day talking about it was a series of bad things that caused him his pride to break so he could come to the merciful God. Sometimes it's the hungry, the desperate, that are broken, the addicted, the ashamed that find him like this woman. I, I don't care where you are but I do care about where you're going. And I just want to say this to you, call on his name right now. Say, I don't know his name. His name's Jesus. Call on his name right now. Jesus, save me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, meet me. Jesus, love me. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, Jesus, give me something better than what's at the bottom of the bottle that's in the inside of this syringe that's on the internet in front of my face. God, just, I want to be intoxicated with you. I want to be addicted to you. I want to know the superior pleasures of your kingdom and the power of loving my king. So I ask you to step into my world. Ask the I'm perfect to love the imperfect. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The information of the what is beautiful, it's powerful, but the revelation of the why activates it got a beautiful machine called knowledge but there has to be a source of power that the Holy Spirit reveals to you his heart. You want to live a changed life? Then be changed by the author of life in Jesus' name. One last thing, Father, for people that will be standing and sitting where we're standing and sitting Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. We pray for a tremendous harvest. Bring us the broken. Bring us the addicted. Bring us the unloved. Bring us the, the convicted. Bring us everybody, God, that, that's looking for a Savior. The Pharisees will come and they'll be upset about the volume and the, the lights and, the, you know, they'll pick up their rocks and they'll be gone. Send us the prostitutes. Send us the drug dealers and the tax collectors. Send us people that need a revelation of a loving God and let us show them your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry I went over today. You guys okay? Altar workers are coming forward to pray with anybody that needs prayer. If you want to sit and pray for a while. If we could find an especially soothing song, guys, nothing with a, with a bass, just something real mellow. If you'd like to stay and pray for a while and dig into this, you're welcome. If not, God bless you. Be praying this week. I'm going to head back to the guest room and spend some time, maybe 10 minutes or so. And then I've got, a, I've got the privilege of speaking to somebody else after about 10 minutes. So God bless you. We'll see you soon.